I have the uh, pleasure of chairing today's uh, session. So I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker is John uh, Gehring, who has a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and he is currently the professor of government at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. He's the principal investigator of a couple of different large uh, projects, the Global Leadership Project and the Varieties of uh, Democracy Project, which many of us uh, have used. He's the author of 11 books, as far as I can tell, uh, including the seminal case study research, principles and practices, and my personal favorite social science methodology, a unified framework. This year alone, uh, he's published three books. Uh, the first one is The Product of Knowledge, Enhancing Progress in Social Science. The second one is Varieties of Democracy, Measuring Two Centuries of Political Change. And the third one is Population and Politics, The Impact of Scale. Uh, his research has been published in numerous uh, journals, including the American Political Science Review, British Journal of Political Science, Comparative Political Studies, uh, International Organization, Perspectives on Politics, uh, and World Politics, amongst many others. He also is also the recipient of numerous grants from the National Science Foundation in the United States, Danish Council of Independent Research, the World Bank, and the Clinton Global Initiative. Today, he's speaking on the topic of the deep roots of democracy, which is a book manuscript uh, in progress. Uh, John has kindly sent me a copy of it. If anyone is interested in, in having a read and providing comments, uh, please get in touch uh, with me. Uh, so today, I'd very much like to welcome John, uh, and he will speak for 30 minutes, uh, give or take, and we'll open it up for questions uh, after that. So John, I will turn the floor over to you. <clears throat> Well, thanks, Lee, and uh, it's really a pleasure to get an opportunity to share some some research with you. Uh, I'd rather be there in person, needless to say, but uh, I'll take what I can get, and uh, uh, we'll just try to try to make the best of of a somewhat odd, but I guess increasingly normal uh, protocol. Um, <clears throat> so, as Lee mentioned, this is a work in progress, which is kind of advantageous for me, but maybe a little less advantageous for you in that um, not everything is nailed down, not everything is final, and uh, I can really benefit from, from your thoughts on this. Um, it's a big book. It's a controversial subject. I expect there'll be some uh, provocative things that I'll say in the next 30 minutes, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I look forward to, to the exchange and, and the interest of hearing what you have to say. I'm going to try to get through the material as quickly as possible, uh, but because there's a lot of it, it means I'm going to speak quickly and take some shortcuts. And uh, if I'm I'm really leaving out some essentials, I'll trust that Lee will jump in and 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 uh, nudge me. But uh, I we may have to wait till the end to to explain uh, what's going on and for, to follow up your questions because we don't really have the the uh, <clears throat> the luxury of of responding as we go as one would normally in a talk. So let me explain a little bit about the um, the motivation for this project. Uh, you know, I've been working on democracy uh, pretty much my whole career, and uh, all of that time I've been focused on this modern era from 1800 or 1789 to the present. And yet when you look at this period, uh, there really isn't that much going on. Uh, this is a histogram showing all countries in the world over that 200 year time period. And the number of transitions that are recorded in the Bosch, uh, Miller, and Rosado data set, which is a binary coding of democracy. Um, now, binary coding is not my favorite way to understand democracy, but it shows you that most countries, the modal value is zero. And after that, there are 50 plus ones, and then a smattering of countries with more than one transition. And what that means is that even if one looks at the past 200 years, the past two centuries, there's not a lot of variation going on. The countries that were democratic a long time ago are still democratic, and likewise for autocracies. So if we want to understand variation in the world today, we need to stretch back further. And this is the period of time, the pre-modern era, that um, uh, that I want to, well, not exclusively that, but that, that really distinguishes this, this type of argument from the rest of the work that's been done in the field up until fairly recently. So here's an overview of the argument. <clears throat> it combines two major factors, natural harbors and European ancestry. Uh, but they interact in the sense that European ancestry is in, is in part a, a product of those oceanic uh, uh, characteristics of countries. 
and they both uh, contribute to democracy. Now, it's not a, a monocausal or a, a bicausal uh, argument. Uh, lots of other things are going on, but we think, uh, my uh, collaborators and I, that these uh, two factors are especially important and generally neglected. So here's a quick look at the uh, terms that I'm going to be using to express different, different periods in history. And um, <clears throat> here's a look at how I'm understanding democracy uh, over the long haul. Um, it isn't just limited to uh, universal suffrage regimes. It's intended to be a term that we can, we can use to talk about a whole range of polities stretching back to, to Athens with these two dimensions, accountability and membership. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you look, the, the only really even kind of quasi comprehensive view of democracy in the pre-modern world is from uh, an et, the, what's called the Ethnographic Atlas, put together by George Murdoch and many, many other anthropologists based on ethnographies around the turn of the century and various other periods of time. And here you can see uh, uh, a lot of diversity. Uh, democracy was not a, uh, a European uh, monopoly, so to speak, uh, if we think about the selection of headmen. There's a lot of variability uh, around the world from this data set. So the first part of the argument deals with coastal geography. <clears throat> oh, but I should say, although um, this is a fun uh, uh, view, it, it's not a very good uh, uh, or, or accurate view of, of polities in the pre-modern era because it's largely limited. What, what they're really coding, these eth ethnographies, are ethnic groups. And a lot of state-like entities are entirely missing. As you can see, China is, is not uh, represented here. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, at least I don't think it is, a lot of major uh, states and civilizations are not uh, in the ethnographic atlas because they don't map on to specific ethnic groups. OK, so <clears throat> coastal geography uh, it is um, about the geographic features of the world and how they have affected mobility uh, of people and of uh, goods and, and capital uh, and how that in turn has affected these five elements, uh, economic development, the predominance of naval power over uh, uh, land power, the size of states, the openness of polities to, uh, to foreign goods and ideas and immigration, and finally, the ability of people to uh, enter and exit and uh, the ability or inability of, of rulers to control their, uh, their movements. And all of these, in all of these respects, uh, we argue that harbors uh, fostered uh, 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 factors or, or, or mediation, mediators that were propitious for democracy. More economic development, urbanization, growth of the bourgeoisie, predominance of naval power, and the argument here is that um, <clears throat> if your if your military strength is 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 uh, is uh, located in the navy, the navy has less capacity and less interest for intervening in repression, overturning governments, and so forth. Whereas a, a, a land power, uh, a, a vast uh, uh, army. Um, is very capable and oftentimes very interested in running governments. Um, so naval powers tend to be less engaged and smaller in size, more technocratic. Um, <clears throat> and this, the size argument is something that applies, I think, especially to the pre-modern era where it was very, very difficult to run, to involve normal citizens in politics from any perspective, but especially so if the state or empire was large. So small size was pretty much a precondition to any element of, of constitutionality or democracy, um, as we might use the term today. Um, the argument about openness is pretty commonsensical, I guess. Uh, harbor regions tended to be open to the world. They thrived on trade. They attracted a lot of immigrants from everywhere. They were melting pots. Well, maybe not always melting pots, but they included very diverse populations religiously, culturally, linguistically, and so forth. And over time, the argument is that um, there was a, came to be a greater acceptance of tolerance, and this was uh, a building block for democracy. And finally, um, in a uh, harbor region where people uh, can come and go pretty easily, um, it's much harder for rulers to control people. 
<clears throat> so the threat of exit, uh, which plays a big part in, in certain uh, theorizing about regimes, it means that rulers need to uh, to treat the citizens with respect, especially those citizens who have a lot of capital, which is very mobile, especially if it's rooted in trade, which is a mobile factor, as opposed to land, which is which is not. So normally I would stop and say, are there any questions? But I realize uh, I can't do that, so I'm just going to plow on as if everything that I just said were perfectly clear. Um, <clears throat> So let's take a look at the, the history of ocean travel. Here's a uh, one attempt at uh, constructing a chronology, and as, as is pretty obvious, uh, uh, ocean travel arrived at different times in different parts of the world. And uh, by this, I don't mean um, one-time migrations. I mean continual back and forth uh, travel that is conducive to trade and, and ongoing immigration. Uh, so we're talking about a long-term process, but it, it doesn't have the, the same uh, a long history or as long history in every part of the world. <clears throat> um, moving to uh, the contemporary or the, the modern era, early modern, modern era, uh, we can map the, the uh, increase uh, of maritime activity across a whole bunch of different dimensions. Um, this, is, uh, this set of statistics focuses on Europe. Here are some statistics that uh, are, are global in nature, um, looking at the carrying capacity of ships, um, the size and speed uh, of those ships, and the share of, um, uh, of trade uh, that was carried, um, oh, sorry, the share of GDP that was uh, uh, composed of exports. And since almost all of those exports were carried by water, um, that, that becomes a, a good marker of increasing uh, uh, shipping activity. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so how do, we, um, how do we measure this concept of a natural harbor? Well, we start out with uh, a resource called the World Ports Index, which is published, has been published every year uh, since 1960 or thereabouts and which offers a, a typology of ports. And that's what you see before you is a, uh, whatever, six, seven, eight, nine part typology. And the check marks in the final right column indicate er, uh, those categories that we regard as natural. And by natural, we mean that they are an, um, <clears throat> ports that were situated in a particular place because it uh, that place was propitious for constructing a port. Um, and if our classification is correct, uh, over half of the existing large ports uh, around the world uh, have these one of these natural characteristics, coastal natural, river natural, river basin, or canal or lake. Um, to um, To uh, map this onto the world, though, we can't take ports that already exist because there's uh, we're, we're obviously going to be missing a lot of the activity. There could be lots of natural harbors that were never developed into ports or weren't large enough to be uh, to be listed in the WPI. So what we do is, and we've experimented with different techniques, but the technique that I think we're going to stick with is one that looks at the squiggliness of the coastline and um, uses this uh, classification uh, as an outcome and different squiggly lines, uh, if you want to say degrees of squiggliness and, and the lines that constitute the coasts of all the continents of the world um, <clears throat> to, uh, to, to um, mark a breakpoint, a cutoff in that um, set of segments, line segments within each grid cell. Uh, all of this is based on 50 by 50 uh, kilometer grid cells at the basis of the PRIO uh, grid cell uh, uh, data set, GIS data set. And if you use that technique, these are the parts of the world that uh, had natural harbors. That is to say, places along the coast that were conducive to, um, to constructing uh, ports. <clears throat> You can see Europe is very well endowed, as are the coasts of uh, North America, the Caribbean, parts of South America, a few parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, um, certainly many parts of Australia, 
and um, uh, some parts of Japan and the coast along China. I'm sorry about the quality of this map. This is going to be improved in the next uh, the next iteration. <clears throat> so, uh, having laid out how to measure natural harbors, we then move to the um, I guess you might say the testing uh, portion of this uh, this section of the book where I compare different regions of the world with a primary focus on within region comparisons. So within Europe, you can think about areas being less aqueous or more aqueous in terms of their uh, distance from natural harbors. And this is sort of how it, how it uh, breaks down. Um, the most aqueous regions of the British Isles, Italy, the Low Countries, Scandinavia, along the, the, North, um, <clears throat> the North Sea and uh, less aqueous regions in the center of the continent, uh, of course. And um, within each region, uh, I show that the histories pretty much align with their exposure to the ocean. That is to say, the more oceanic, oceanic more aqueous regions are more likely to develop democracy uh, in the uh, pre-modern and modern eras, and the more um, continental or, or uh, earthbound uh, areas are less likely to do so. Uh, so maybe you've had a chance to glance at this, <clears throat> um, and I'm happy to elaborate, but I'm going to move on just in the interest of time. Uh, so we can use that ethnographic atlas as a, as a very crude sort of first pass at uh, the uh, degree of democracy present in societies uh, uh, prior to the modern era. And here we find that uh, natural harbor distance is a, a reasonably good predictor of the existence of uh, the democratic selection of headmen and ethnic groups around the world if you focus on those uh, ethnic groups that had state-like forms of political organization. And that's what this jurisdictional hierarchy uh, across the top uh, row is showing. If we turn to the modern era, which uh, is uh, 1789 to the present, and we use the polyarchy index from the VDEM project as our measure of democracy, uh, which happens to be very highly correlated with polity two and most other measures, we find um, a very strong association between uh, the distance of natural harbors and the uh, degree of democracy present over the past 230 years. Uh, this is a, a, a test that focuses on grid cells with a variety of different covariates inserted in different models as, as uh, background factors. Um, and you can see that the estimates are very constant uh, and uh, a yeah, huge number of observations just because of how many grid cells there are. Um, here we turn to countries as units of analysis. We run the same, uh, the same type of specification test, although in this case we have a lot more covariates that we can use uh, in these models. Um, and again, the results are very strong and fairly consistent if you look at the size of the, of the estimates across these different models. I should say that all of these models have uh, year fixed effects and the standard errors are clustered by country. Uh, if we want to know how big an effect it is, we can look at predictive margins from the, um, from the benchmark model, and uh, you can see a, a modest, though I think not, uh, not trivial effect. Um, as distance to natural harbor increases, your score, predicted score on the polyarchy index goes down, uh, all other factors being equal. <clears throat> um, so here's a look at variations in this model through time, and we find that the predictive power of natural harbors in this benchmark model increases over time. Uh, you'll see, recall that the, the, uh, the effect is negative, so as this line goes down, it means that the effect gets bigger and it stays uh, fairly constant, although it appears to be diminishing, attenuating at the end of the 21st century. Here's a look at the analysis using differently sized grid cells, and uh, this is important if you think about uh, the problem of non-independence across units. Um, arguably, the bigger the cell, the less problem of interference or a suit for violations you have, and uh, predictably, the effect increases as the grid cells uh, get smaller. 
that's what this is, is showing. <clears throat> All right. So that's the first part of the argument. And now I will blithely turn to the second part, um, <clears throat> uh, which concerns Europeans. Uh, here's a, a quote from uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, many of you have probably run across this before. It's, it's often uh, 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 you know, qu uh, quoted in, in works uh, as being emblematic of uh, the uh, enlightened opinion in Europe uh, with respect to colonialism. And uh, what Mill is telling us is that uh, you know, some people are capable of, of democracy and other people are not. And uh, so it's the responsibility of the colonial powers to uh, to rule those who can't rule themselves um, <clears throat> until they're they're able to do so. Um, <clears throat> such is the ideal rule of a free people over a barbarous or semi barbarous one. And this, uh, you know, I think exemplifies a, a widely held view in in Europe uh, throughout the the um, early modern and, and modern period, I think until sometime in the 20th century. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's the basis of, of the argument that, uh, that I want to make, uh, namely that um, Europeans saw uh, democracy as something that Europeans were capable of and others were not. And um, therefore it was their responsibility and conveniently it was in their self-interest to uh, institute democracy where they were a majority but to limit the uh, involvement of non-Europeans in those democratic arrangements uh, in around the world. And so this leads us to uh, one major argument, which is that European ancestry is a distal cause of democracy. And several uh, subordinate arguments that are kind of uh, uh, peripheral to that, <clears throat> that uh, civil and political rights are allocated to exclude non-Europeans that uh, the inclusion of non-Europeans is more likely where they are fewer in number, and that the relationship between European demography, uh, demography and democracy peaks in the mid 20th century, declining thereafter as the power of Europeans, and uh, in my hopeful view, the importance of race as a category in, in social and political life uh, declines. So where do these Europeans come from? Well, the variable that we, uh, try to measure through time uh, in every country and, and semi-autonomous unit colony uh, back to 1600 is we call it European ancestry. It's simply the, the number of the share of, of the population that uh, shares uh, ancestry in, in Europe. Um, the the, the uh, assignment, if you will, of uh, or how how countries get different different uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, scores on this on this variable. Uh, is due to a whole bunch of things, uh, including natural harbors, but uh, other geographic factors. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the work by Ajumalu Johnson and Robinson and many others on uh, the, uh, the colonialism, uh, this will be uh, very familiar. Uh, I'm, we're not breaking new ground here. Here's a, a set of maps that show our measure of European ancestry through time, beginning in 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900. <laughs> Um, and uh, we have maps for the 20th century, although it doesn't change too much. Uh, you can see, uh, I think, a fairly predictable and, and uh, familiar uh, uh, transformation here as Europeans spread throughout the world, but not evenly. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is what we're going to use to predict uh, democracy across different periods. Here's a look at, the, uh, uh, at a histogram of this variable. Uh, you can see um, uh, a mode uh, at zero or pretty near zero. Lots of parts of the world, uh, much of Asia and Africa has close to zero Europeans. There's another mode uh, at the other extreme, uh, places like North America and Australasia, uh, and the rest of the cases are in between. <clears throat> um, now you might be thinking that European ancestry is pretty similar to, to, to colonialism, um, and it it, it is and it isn't. If we take the most common measure uh, of, of colonialism, um, that is to say a, a common measure in terms of predicting democracy and economic development, which is to say colonial duration in years, we find a pretty loose association. Um, and that's illustrated here on the scatter plot. So this is not just a replication of the standard argument about colonial duration leading to development. <clears throat> 
Um, if we look at this relationship within empires, and I have a whole chapter that's devoted to the British, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, and who else? I guess those are the main uh, empires that, that I deal with. Um, here's an attempt to deal with it statistically. Uh, <clears throat> so we're isolating the world of countries to those that uh, were parts of the British Empire in Model 1 and were parts of the Spanish Empire in Model 2. And uh, the predictor here is, is European ancestry. You see a strong relationship, even when we limit the uh, sample to these um, subsets, presumably, you know, similar uh, uh, political arrangements in other, in other respects. So, in other words, the British um, <clears throat> uh, colonists saw fit to govern themselves in places where there were lots of Europeans, but where they were a small minority, like in most of the Caribbean, they thought, hey, this is not such a great idea. Uh, in fact, why don't we just remain part of the uh, mother country? And this next slide is showing how uh, the share of European ancestry um, is a, actually a pretty good predictor of year of independence, the alacrity with which countries uh, uh, militated toward, uh, f or, or agitated for independence and were able to, to achieve it. Um, there was a, a, a noted resistance to independence on the part of colonies where Europeans were a small minority because they didn't want to be uh, subject to um, majority rule. Um, here's a look at uh, global analyses, including all countries and all years for which we have data, uh, regressing democracy against European ancestry and a whole bunch of different covariates. Uh, and you see uh, a very strong and, and consistent uh, result here, more Europeans, more democracy. Here's a look at some sample restrictions, some subsample analyses <clears throat> showing the same basic pattern in all parts of the world, although with some variation in effect. Here's uh, some instrumental variable analyses using different uh, factors, mostly geographic as, as instruments for um, European ancestry. And they show very similar, although in some cases stronger uh, results. <clears throat> and here's a look at predicted values from the benchmark model as the uh, European ancestry increases, the predicted value of polyarchy also increases. If we, if we uh, run these analyses in a rolling regression through time, we find increases up until the mid to late 20th century, followed by a marked downturn. And that's consistent with our exp uh, expectations. The final section of the book is, is devoted to alternate explanations. And uh, I won't have time to run through all of this, but I do want to show you a little bit about how our variables stack up against others that you might think are similar or uh, at least similar in their um, uh, sort of class of, 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 uh, of explanations. Um, so here we look at, at geographic factors. Um, <clears throat> And you'll see that most of these uh, in the first column, we're just showing bivariate uh, models. Uh, so these are 14 separate models. And in the remaining uh, uh, specifications, it's uh, each column is a, is a separate model. Um, so what you'll see here is that only two factors amongst all of these uh, geographic predictors are robust in the predicted direction. Um, that's natural harbor distance at the bottom and temperature at the top. Both are negatively correlated with democracy. And temperature is highly correlated with uh, tropical distance from equator, frost days. These are all sort of measuring the same thing. Uh, and that's part of a story that I think is very well known from the work of Jared Diamond, AJR, um, and Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons to imagine that climate uh, may have affected long-term development and uh, also political development. Um, but this is, this is showing us that there's another factor that no one's really talked about, and that's uh, natural harbor distance. All right, getting to the end here. Um, and this slide is um, looking at predictive power for these two factors, temperature and natural harbor and showing that, uh, at least in the contemporary era, their uh, effect or the amount of variability in democracy that they're able to explain is, is fairly comparable. <clears throat> and 
now we turn to um, <clears throat> the uh, European ancestry variable and it's um, uh, uh, the, the other modalities of, of European um, European influence uh, where we can count European uh, English colonial uh, duration, European colonial duration, indirect rule, Protestants, Catholics, European language um, as as sort of rivals or, or maybe different ways of measuring something similar. And you'll see that here there are also two winners, uh, so to speak, um, two factors that are very strong and robust in all the tests that I've uh, been able to run. Uh, that's uh, European ancestry and Protestants. Protestants, uh, for, for those following the literature, got a lot of attention uh, recently from an uh, APSR article by Bob Woodbury, who lives uh, down the street from me. And um, <clears throat> I have no particular reason to doubt that argument. Well, maybe some reason to doubt it, but the, uh, the empirical results are certainly very robust. Um, if we put those two together, those two European influences, and we look at their uh, potential or correlation with, or potential influence, actual correlation with democracy through time, we see this, um, uh, this interesting graph that shows a peak in the early to mid 20th century and an attenuation thereafter. Uh, and maybe that's an accurate representation of the impact of Europeans on democracy through time. Um, it kind of fits with my expectations. I'll leave that for, for commentary.